Good morning. I'm trying something new today. Kevin and Chris Vaughn, Kevin, happy, happy, happy birthday to you. Came up on my Facebook timeline. I hope you have a great one. Hi, Larry and Carolyn Thomas. Hi, Barry and Margo. Judy Sutherland is with us. Barbara Wolf, hello. Carrie's with us. Scott Johnson's with us. Ken Woods. I'm very happy here. It seems like my comments are streaming today, which has been something new. Who really knows? Who really understands computers, right? We're on a little bit early today, so because I've just had problems the last several times, so I wanted to make sure that I didn't didn't have a problem. Morgan Buffa, Al, Ramel, Kevin, Marwan, Dixon, Rick Wan. Have a yeah, happy happy birthday. I've stopped counting birthdays. I have. Hi, Sue McCausland. I have decided that uh, I have decided that uh, it's just not worth counting them anymore because I don't feel my age. Hi, Nora Bentley. Great news about Ava. She is certainly brave. Certainly brave. We'll continue to pray for Ava and her family. We prayed before, but we're going to continue to pray. Hi, Ann Winslow. Ann, I drove past your house yesterday. I had to go down to Wyandotte to, uh, to visit Barbara Jo Carson, who I think is going to be okay. Uh, we'll pray for that also. And so as I made that uh, right-hand turn onto Jefferson, which becomes Biddle, right? Um, but uh, you got that great shot of the river. And uh, I was looking right at the, the largest freighter on the Great Lakes, the Paul R. Tegurtha. And uh, it's a PRT, as they say, 1,003 foot long. And there it was right in front of me. So you don't see it every day, although it makes it, it, it um, if you haven't, figured it out. I'm kind of a boat nerd. And, um, but the, uh, she, she makes a, a standard run from uh, Duluth, Minnesota, where she picks up coal. And then she uh, runs all the way across Superior and then down through the, the Sioux Locks and the St. Mary's Channel. And then um, over into Lake Huron and then down um, Lake St. Clair, and then down the Detroit River, and then down over into Erie. And, um, but actually she doesn't get all the way to Erie sometimes. A lot of times she's going right to Monroe for, and delivers that coal to the, uh, to the power, big power plant there. But she'll, she'll continue on sometimes too. So just something that I like to, like to stay up on is the freighters. I have my, I, I've been on one. I think everybody probably knows that. I have a really good friend that uh, was a captain. He retired, retired uh, this spring. So no more free trips on freighters for me. But for a while, it was really nice there. And they are, they are a, an awesome experience. So hi, Judy Hatch. So let's see here. 
Barbara Wolf, yeah. I think I said hello. Hi, Gene Hartwig, and Aunt Mary is with us. Judy Martin, good morning, good morning. Hi, Joanne Butters, good to have you too. So before we get going, I'll tell you just a little funny story. Um, we, um, Meg and I bought a new to us pontoon boat that we have up at the cottage and it was delivered this year. Hi, Kathy. And um, so the guy that delivered it, he was really good, but he wanted to make sure, you know, that, uh, you know, and I think he makes the assumption that everybody's like never boated before. So as they delivered, they dropped it off the trailer in the water, and then he and I went out. He was kind of running me through everything, and um, I, I was playing with him a little bit, saying I didn't, you know, and so then when I got behind the wheel, I just opened it up and went. <laughs> he had this surprised look, and he goes, you've been fooling me. Said, yeah, so then as we started talking about boating and everything, he goes, well, what's the biggest boat that you've ever piloted? And I said, 765 feet. <laughs> and he looked at me. So that was that. That was the freighter. My buddy, uh, under safe conditions, allowed me to take the helm of the freighter. So, although I have, I'm I unique, I was, a, I actually piloted it, uh, piloted it through uh, the Sioux locks. So he was right next to me, pretty much telling me what to do. But it is, that's an experience anyway. So when you get a chance to do that, you kind of, you kind of get hooked on them a little bit. All right, so we're going to go on here. And now we had trustees meeting last night, and uh, everything's looking pretty good. We're kind of running up into our uh, summer. So, um, you know, we kind of go into into uh, hold on some of our meeting stuff. Uh, time try to take July. A lot of people take vacations in July. I'm going to take the first two weeks of July off. Um, but uh, Sunday, July July Fourth is a Sunday, and because of that, it's really hard to find anybody to fill in. So we're actually not going to be live on July Fourth. We are going to pre-record that and then uh, stream that. Um, just because, number one, very hard to get somebody to fill in, uh, if not impossible. And then the second thing is, is I think a lot of other people are not going to be really church oriented on that on that fourth, um, because there's lots of stuff going on. So we decided that we would just we would do that and take advantage of the technology that we've upgraded to. So that's kind of it. We'll move on here to our readings for Wednesday. June 16, 2021. I hope I titled this right. I hope I didn't put Thursday down. But anyway, it is June 16th. It's Wednesday. And we're going to open up. Here's one that we don't hear often. Our Psalm 89 is our opening psalm. So let's, uh, let's just take a second here to center ourselves. Breathe deep. Think about God, right? And all the other things that we've got to get done today or are giving us worry about what's going to happen. Let's not worry. Let's just not even think about those, right? Let's just concentrate on God right now. And God's word for us. So we're going to open it up with Psalm 89, verse 1 through 18. So let's listen for the word of the Lord together today. I will sing of your steadfast love, O Lord, forever. With my mouth I will proclaim your faithfulness to all generations. I declare that your steadfast love is established forever. Your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. You said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to my servant David. I will establish your descendants forever and build your throne for all generations. Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord? A God feared in the council of the holy ones, great and awesome above all that are around him. O Lord, God of hosts, who is as mighty as you, O Lord? Your faithfulness surrounds you. You rule the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. You crushed Rahab like a carcass. You scattered your enemies with your mighty arm. The heavens are yours, the earth also is yours, the world and all that it is in it, you have founded them. The north and the south, you created them. Tabor and Hermon joyously praise your name. 
You have a mighty arm, strong as your hand, high your right hand. Righteous and justice are the foundations of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. Happy are the people who know the festal shout, who walk, O Lord, in the light of your countenance. They exult in your name all day long and extol your righteousness. For you are the glory of their strength. By your favor, our horn is exalted. For our shield belongs to the Lord, our King, to the Holy One of Israel. So ends this reading of the word of the Lord. All thanks be to God. We don't know who wrote this. It talks about David, so it has to, has to be after David. Um, there is some thought that this might be uh, one attributed to Solomon, David's son, the very wise one. And the interesting thing is, if it does, this last line, verse 18, right, says, Our shield belongs to the Lord. Isn't it great when a politician talks it's not about me or mine, but our? It says, Our shield belongs to the Lord, our king to the Holy One of Israel. So it means that, you know, the king recognizes that he's subservient to God. All right. Here we go. We're moving into First Samuel. We're continuing on. I think the story of Samuel is really neat. Um, because it, 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 has, um, it has people committing to God, right? And then, and then God calling. Uh, we'll hear that. You know, as you go through, but uh, God calling to someone, and um, um, it talks about the way things were with the before Jerusalem, before the temple in Jerusalem. So they had, they had, did they did have some sort of a building that uh, the Ark of the Covenant resided in at Shiloh. There was an altar there, um, and then we had the royal. Uh, well, I'm sorry, not royal, but we had the the Levitical priests. So we have Eli. So here we go. So uh, we left this yesterday where Samuel, Hannah, uh, who was barren, uh, had prayed and asked uh, for a son. She was given it, and in return, she has committed um, that son, Samuel, as a Nazarite, uh, someone who is, uh, who is bound to God. And she, as a very young child, she has given him to the priests so that he might uh, serve God and serve them. And then, uh, um, and then we, uh, uh, and then he comes, goes on to do great things, which is told here in both First and Second Samuel. So now we're at chapter two, verse twelve through twenty-six. And let's listen. We're going to hear about Eli. Eli is the chief priest. Now the sons of Eli were scoundrels. They had no regard for the Lord or the duties or for the duties of the priest to the people. When anyone offered sacrifice, the priest's servants would come while the meat was boiling with a three-pronged fork in his hand, and he would thrust it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. All that the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. This is what they did at Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. Moreover, before the fat was burned, the priest's servant would come and say to the one who was sacrificing, Give meat for the priest to roast, for he will not accept boiled meat from you, but only raw. And if the man said to him, Let them burn the fat first, and then take whatever they wish, he would say, No, you must give it now. If not, I will take it by force. Thus the sin of the young men was very great in the sight of the Lord, for they treated the offerings of the Lord with contempt. Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy wearing a linen ephod. His mother used to make for him a little robe and take it to him each year when she went with up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. Then Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, May the Lord repay you with children by this woman for the gift that she made to the Lord. And then they would return to their home. And the Lord took note of Hannah. She conceived and bore three sons and two daughters, and the boy Samuel grew up in the presence of the Lord. Now Eli was very old. He heard all that his sons were doing to all Israel, and how they lay with the women who served at the entrance to the tent of meeting. He said to them, Why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings from all these people. No, my sons, it is not a good report that I hear the people of the Lord spreading abroad. 
if one person sins against another, someone can intercede for the sinner and with the Lord. But if someone sins against the Lord, who can make intercession? But they would not listen to the voice of their father, for it was the will of the Lord to kill them. Now the boy Samuel continued to grow both in stature and in favor with the Lord and with the people. So ends this reading of the word of the Lord. So um, pastor's kids sometimes, <laughs> sometimes are the, um, they are the hellions of the church. You know, they, they, uh, cause people have high expectations of them. And, um, but uh, we've been very lucky with our kids, but I do know that there's a lot of pastor kids that struggle, uh, especially with their, with their spirituality because they've been raised in the church and, and they've seen, you know, they've seen um, the raw side of the church. You know, so sometimes, sometimes uh, it's not easy. So they kind of say, why, you know, why would God bless somebody and then treat them like that? Um, because some, some churches do uh, make it very difficult for ministers. So it's no different back then, right? And so here's his sons and that they would go. Now, the way that things worked here is that when people came and they offered the finest of their meats for sacrifice, Normally, what would happen is that it would be um, it would be put uh, on a fire and a fragrant offering, right? Um, and then it would be put into this cauldron, and then the priests would come and their families would come, and they would just reach in and they would take it, and that would be their meat. But now they're saying his sons would go and just say, "Hey, don't even bother. Just give it to me, because we we don't like the way that it, we don't like it boiled." And um, so Eli has let this happen. And he's also, they've also abused their power because since their father was a priest, they were also, they're part of the Levites. And here's another thing. You know, priests, uh, ministers, whether we like it or not, um, don't, don't understand that we have a lot of power um, over people sometimes. And so here's, here's his sons who have abused that power terribly. And we know that there's still pastoral abuse that occurs today. Um, and it's a terrible thing. And it, and, it, and it turns people against the church when it does happen. So, right, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Here, there's a problem there, too. So, but we've heard now that he, uh, that uh, Samuel has kind of stepped in, not only as a, a trainee under Eli, but also kind of filling in for his own sons. All right, we'll move on to the uh, Acts. New Testament. <clears throat> move into the second chapter, verses 1 through 21. So this is the Pentecost, right? We've heard this story before. So Pentecost is, stands for 50 days. It was 50 days after, um, after the Easter event. And, and Pentecost was also already, 50 days after Passover, um, was a celebration. So... Uh, Pentecost, the people were getting ready for, for, for a high holy holiday anyway. So here we go. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly, from heaven, um, sorry, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues, as a fire, appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own language, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea 
and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So ends this reading of the word of the Lord. You know me, I love Pentecost, right? I've got special red stuff that I wear. So um, so this was the birth of the church. Now, here's the interesting thing. The Pentecostal arm of Christianity is very, very popular. And it's actually, until recently, was the fastest growing um, arm of Christianity. And it's still very big. But um, a lot of what we see in South America and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa uh, is Pentecostal, so a very active worship, uh, uh, believe in um, signs and wonders, um, and to be honest, there's pretty some pretty awesome stuff that goes on, um, and um, so with this though, if you, if you talk to a Pentecostal, they say that there's multiple levels of baptism. There's, there's the baptism, which is really a dedication, and then there's the baptism uh, of commitment, and then there's a baptism of, uh, of tongues, which means that the Holy Spirit has resided in that person. And when they have that, then they 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 gain the ability to actually speak with authority within the church. So um, um, here's the problem with that. The problem is is that early in this passage it says that they spoke in different languages, but really, if we go further down, what it says is that people gain the ability to hear, right, the other language and to understand it in their own language. So speaking in tongues is this uh, thing that, uh, if you've ever been to a Pentecostal service, you'll see people do it. And, uh, but the big thing is not the speaking in tongues, it's the understanding of other tongues. All right, we'll move on here. And uh, Gospel read, Luke chapter 20 verse 27 through 40. So we've, uh, we're seeing Jesus put to the test by the temple authorities, right? The Pharisees and the Sadducees. Sadducees were, um, they were, they were the elite of the Hebrew society. And, um, they, um, but they also, uh, they didn't believe in the resurrection or at the end, in the end days. So that was sad, you see. Um, so here we go. So uh, as we've been following through, Jesus has been teaching in parables. Uh, and now yesterday was answering questions that they were using to try to trick him to get rid of him. Uh, and and um, so this is where we pick up here. Some Sadducees, those who say there is no resurrection, came to him and asked him a question. Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, leaving a wife but no children, the man shall marry the widow and raise up children for his brother. Now, there were seven brothers. The first married and died childless. Then the second and the third married her. And so, in the same way, all seven died childless. Finally, the woman also died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will the woman be? For the seven had married her. Jesus said to them, those who belong to this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy of a place in that age and in the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. Indeed, they cannot die anymore because they are like angels and are children of God, being children of the resurrection. And the fact that the dead were raised, Moses himself showed. In the story about the bush, where he speaks of the Lord as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now he is God, not of the dead, but of the living, for to him all of them are alive. And some of the scribes answered, Teacher, you have spoken well, for they no longer dared to ask him any question. 
go into this reading of the word of the Lord. All thanks be to God. So a big thing, very clearly Luke says these were Sadducees. And he says they do not believe in the resurrection. And they ask this question saying, well, the, the social structure of the time said that if a man dies, um, that his brother, if his brother was unmarried, that his brother would then marry the widow. And he says there's seven brothers. The oldest brother dies, doesn't have any kids, but and then each of the brothers sequentially um, marries her and then dies. And so they're saying, so there's one thing here. There was no children. Uh, and then the second thing is that uh, they ask, well, okay, so when the resurrection comes, right, whose wife will the woman be? Now, they're asking this question. They don't believe in it. So they're obviously just trying to catch him in something. So Jesus, in his answer, says a couple things, but one of the things is that he confirms that there is a resurrection, that it is eternal. And, and the word, the important thing about it is that we have structures that God has put in place in our society, marriage, right, one being one of them, that when we're elevated into heaven and the kingdom of heaven is, is that our relationships with each other and with God will be different so that it's not that marriage is unimportant. It is. It serves the purpose that God wants it to on this earth. But also, um, we know that um, we're just not sure about how that relationship with each other is going to be. However, we know it's going to be glorious and wonderful, right? That, uh, and that's probably because the things that we think are most important here, right, are going to be really worthless in the kingdom of heaven. And we don't know. We don't know them. It's beyond our, our realm of understanding. Paul says that when we... Uh, we see um, when we read and we and we experience the Holy Spirit, it's it's like looking through a glass darkly. It's almost like it's a smoked piece of thing, and we can see the other side. We can see shapes moving. It's just the elements of the kingdom that we can see. Yet there's going to come a time when we'll see clearly, and that will be the time of the kingdom of heaven. All right, there we go. I'm going to come back over here. So the other thing um, that we want to uh, mention here is the Kona Ice will be here next Wednesday, uh, from starting at 5.30, and that is going to benefit Wakanda scholarships. So please come on out. Delicious. There's, they have like, I don't know, 35 different flavors. And um, so uh, I've never had the Hawaiian ice, but I'm looking forward to it. So hi, Alan. And Doug Goddard, how are you? Sandy Sauerbeck, hello. Hi, Barbara Shoot. All right, there we go. I caught up to those, so now I'll go down here and see if there's anything else. And if you look on our Facebook page, you all are here with us on this, live on this, so you know. Um, look, look at the Allen Park Presbyterian Church, and you will see that we have some yard signs that... Um, combination of uh, mission and evangelism and um, uh, deacons work together. And uh, so we've got those um, and they're really good. It says, Allen Park Presbyterian Church, God loves you and so do we, let us show you. And uh, we are taking orders um, for those. So we would love to have people put them out, get the word out about the church. Sometimes as Presbyterians, we're not very good about going up to people and introducing ourselves as, as Christians and, and uh, trying to introduce Christ to them. But we could all put a sign in our front yard, right? And it's got contact information. It's got a QR code that if they, uh, if they uh, use the QR code, they'll be taken right to information about the church. So there we go. There you go. All right, now I have a meeting at 9.30, another Zoom meeting. So we gotta get going. I have to pray right now. So we're gonna give thanks. We're gonna give thanks for Ava and uh, pray for healing there, and also continue to pray for healing for Barbara Jo. So here we go. All right. Lord, we've heard so much about you in so many different ways through the readings that we've had today. And we've seen how you have uh, existed since the beginning of time and interacted with society and put structures into place that are designed to help us and point us to you. But we also know that it doesn't end here that, uh, that your reclamation of your own creation will be when this heaven and earth are merged, and that we'll know a kingdom 
that uh, has elements that we can't possibly understand, but we do know that it's wonderful and it is eternal. As we gather here, uh, we want to give thanks for bringing uh, young Ava uh, through that operation. And we know that she's got an awful lot of healing uh, and, and things, Lord, we just want you to, to provide that full healing and comfort and strength to her family. For Barbara Jo Carson, we also ask that uh, she have continued, um, that she continue uh, to uh, recover and Lord, that she be returned. And we want to thank you for the fact that her daughter Terry traveled here to be with her and her other daughters will be coming so that uh, Barbara won't be alone uh, in this time of healing. And there are many other people who are suffering, Lord, uh, who are worried, uh, who sometimes the joy just doesn't seem to be very present in, in, on a day-to-day -day basis. So, Lord, we ask that you just strengthen them and know that even in the depths of any despair, we can see that you are still with us. Lord, with you, nothing is impossible. And let us believe that to the core of our hearts. We thank you for this day, this beautiful day that you've given us. And we ask this all in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Amen, all. God bless you all and uh, love you. And remember, right, God loves you. So do we here at Allen Park Presbyterian Church. And um, we hope that you get a chance to see our new yard signs. If you come by the church, they're all over along Park Avenue and also along Cleveland. You'll see those. They're really they're pretty neat. And uh, so um, have a great day. I'll see you all tomorrow morning. God bless. Bye-bye.